This is Greg Trotline with Offshore Engineer TV, and we're very pleased to be joined today by Cameron McNatt of Motion Energy to discuss his company's wave energy converter technology and its potential to help provide electric service and support on the sea floor. Cameron, to start us off, can you give us a by the numbers look at Motion Energy today using the metrics of your choice? Sure. So Motion Energy has been operating since 2016. We're now at 23 people. Uh, we have built a 10 kilowatt prototype that's been tested at sea for over 14 months now. Our first product, Blue Star, will be 20 kilowatts of wave energy and five kilowatts of solar. And that will be about uh, saving money and CO2 in offshore operations. So per project, we can save somewhere between 10,000 and 80,000 tons of CO2. You know, as I as I said before we came on here, you know, I was looking at your bio, I understand uh, you are from the U.S. and you're now living in Scotland. Um, but, you know, if we can just take a step back a little bit, you know, what attracted you to the ocean technology business? And I guess uh, when and where did you know that yours would be a career in ocean technology? Um, so like most careers, it's a bit of a, a, a winding journey. But when I was younger, I grew up in, in Maryland and, and grew up going out on the water and sailing. Um, the first job I got that I really liked, I worked at a, a company that developed software for naval architecture applications. Uh, and so then I kind of ran with that and got a master's in uh, ocean engineering at Oregon State University, which is where I first started working on wave energy. And then again, following that thread, I went to the University of Edinburgh to do my PhD in hydrodynamics and, and wave energy. And then uh, the funding opportunity came up and my co-founder, Chris Retzler, and I started Motion. You know, uh, Cameron, as I said, you know, we're here primarily to discuss Blue Star and its application and helping to electrify the seafloor. Uh, but before we dig into that, can you give us just the the, the overview, the 50,000 foot view of the motion wave energy converter technology and specifically what differentiates this from other WEC devices and where is motion energy today on the tech development spectrum? Sure. So. Conceptually, our, our wave energy device is, is very simple uh, mechanically. So we just have a, a big hinge, and waves cause a flexing about that hinge, uh, and then that drives a generator. But what we've brought to the table is innovations around the shape of the machine. So you can see our prototype behind me. It has these big scoop things on the front and the back. Uh, we call them wave channels. Uh, they do a number of, you know, actually somewhat kind of nuanced and complex hydrodynamic things, but basically they cause the machine to move a lot more in waves. Uh, and if you move more in waves, you generate more power. And I mentioned my background in, in software. So that's how we developed this design. So it wasn't something that just simply came out of our heads. Uh, we developed a, a software optimization program that basically created tens of thousands of different shape concepts, ran them through a simulation, and uh, kind of competed them against one another to say, you know, the computer thinks these are the best. And of course, we had to validate those. And, and we've continued to evolve the uh, that capabilities and the engineering within that. Um, you know, obviously you come from that software development, naval architecture, marine engineering side. Um, you have sailed the ocean. You know how unforgiving the ocean can be. And you and I'm sure you know from putting your device in the water, you, you simulate it, but then you put it in the water and you learn new things, I'm sure, okay. every day. Um, so when you look at the system behind you, what are the big uh, or the biggest maintenance considerations from your point of view? Um, so... You know, one thing that we've really focused on is trying to make the system as uh, robust and simple as possible. So mechanically, it's very simple. It's just a single hinge that moves back and forth and drives a generator. I think some of the more challenging aspects of that are converting that low speed, high torque mechanical power into electrical power. Generators typically want to run fast, whereas what we have is a, a very slow speed uh, power. And we're using a, a gearbox to convert that into electricity. So that's something that needs special consideration. Um, but we are generating more and more uh, data around that. Um, and then, as you say, you know, the ocean is a harsh and corrosive environment. And so we do have to just follow, you know, engineering standards to make sure that everything on the machine is, is up to sort of offshore codes, paints, uh, things like that. 
Uh, but I know from covering other types of systems, whether it be wind, whether it be wave, whether it be tidal turbine, um, there are fail-safe mechanisms within the units. Say you get, um, you know, rogue waves, you know, the, the, the biggest of the biggest waves. Um, I guess my long-winded kind of question is, what is the maximum operation envelope for this unit? And if conditions get quote unquote out of hand, does it have does it have a means to shut itself down and keep itself safe? So we design the system to be fail safe. And what I mean by that is it doesn't need to enter any sort of survival condition. So the uh, survival and, and that and that's intentional because if something breaks and you can't en enter that survival mode of operation, then you're in trouble. So when we see big waves, uh, and we've seen some big storms this past year, we have some great videos uh, up on YouTube, because uh, we've got some cameras on the machine. Um, the front of the machine has this big slope plate, uh, this big slope nose, and that ensures that the bow always stays submerged. So a really bad load case in ships is when you they get lifted out of the water and then they slam. So that never happens. So we're, we're, waves are overtopping and that's a natural load shedding mechanism. On the hinge side, what would be a concern is what, what's called an end stop. So if you have the hinge actually rotate so far around, you get a metal on metal impact. That's a, that's a bad thing, but we've designed the hinge to be able to accommodate, I think greater than plus or not minus 90 degrees of rotation. So by all the testing we've done, uh, you know, and uh, offshore and in wave tanks, we've never seen that happen. So, so there are envelopes where I think there is an additional risk for deploying the technology. And when we look at projects, uh, we weigh up, you know, how much power is going to be produced, you know, what are the survivability conditions, water depths and things like that. And so we can provide that information around the sort of risk to customers, uh, but it's really designed to operate in as wide an envelope as possible. You know, big, bigger picture, uh, what do you see as the primary challenges or hurdles to bring wave energy converter technology from the fringe to the mainstream and the renewable energy the renewable energy conversation? So we found a really interesting uh, market and application where we're deploying the technology. So it is decarbonizing oil and gas. So we're talking about powering subsea equipment in the oil and gas industry, where the sort of traditional way that that equipment gets power is by running a cable along the seabed, either from a platform or from shore. And so as you might imagine, that running installing that cable is, is very, very expensive. So I liken it to, uh, you know, a traditional electrical grid model. You have a central power station, you distribute that power by cables. And what we're proposing is the distributed renewable model. So instead of running a cable, we provide renewable energy where it's needed. So really we're trying to change the narrative and say, yes, we use wave energy, but our product is also going to have uh, solar panels and battery storage is a really important part of it. So we're providing an offshore renewable microgrid solution, uh, power and communication. So we can, you know, link up to various uh, wireless communications, including the sort of growing uh, low orbit satellite network, Starlink and, and things like that. Um, and so within that, you know, we can offer a cost savings, CO2 savings, and it's really kind of low hanging fruit in this decarbonization challenge. So it's, it's much faster and less expensive to do these, to install these kind of systems than say powering an entire offshore platform with a, a wind farm. And there is a substantial savings. So uh, CO2 savings. So with one of our small machines, we estimate that we can save as much CO2 as a machine that generates 10 times as much power in a traditional renewables market. So with traditional renewables, you're, you know, displacing a unit of gas power production, but here we're displacing a vessel and, you know, a 50 kilometer copper cable. From where you sit, you know, you talked about um, decarbonizing uh, offshore oil and gas, but when you look holistically at the oceans, when you look globally, I guess, what potential do you see for this Blue Star technology? Well, I, I think we're seeing more and more uh, technologies that are looking to be deployed in what's commonly referred to as, as the blue economy. Uh, so besides, you, you know, 
pulling hydrocarbons out of the ground. The industry is very keen to sequester CO2 into the ground. And so there are projects that are being developed where you're going to put very similar technology offshore to put CO2 into the ground. Uh, you, you mentioned um, sort of autonomous vehicles, subsea vehicles. I think that, you know, residential, so the deployment, the testing that we're doing up in Orkney, we have a, a subsea uh, autonomous underwater vehicle with a dock that we've been testing. And so this allows us to deploy a system uh, completely over the horizon with its own power source and leave it there indefinitely and until it needs maintenance. Uh, and that you know, can enable repeat inspection of things like wind farms or you know allows uh, you know the, the Coast Guard to guard your, your coastlines. And then there's kind of you know emerging things like subsea data centers, um, direct water ca uh, CO2 capture from the oceans rather than pulling it out of the air. People are talking about pulling it out of the ocean and that kind of technology needs power. So there's a lot of exciting things that power enables. You know, if we look precisely at the Blue Star technology today, um, can you discuss where it's at in its development cycle and what's your timeline for its specific commercialization? Yeah, so I mean, 2024 is all about commercializing Blue Star. So we have had our prototype out at sea. As I say, it's been tested for 14 months. Cumulatively, cumulatively, it'll be tested through next spring. And we feel that that gives us enough confidence in the performance of the technology that we can roll it out as a product. You know, all the learnings from that, you know, certainly things have not gone perfectly, but you know, if they went perfectly, we wouldn't learn anything. So we're, we're taking all those learnings and we're applying them along with the kind of commercial design into the product. So that product is being designed and we're doing studies for customers right now, uh, front end engineering design studies, feasibility studies, things like that, uh, towards getting the first Blue Star sort of orders in 2024 and 2025. When you look at 2024, what are the key events? What are the key uh, milestones that you hope to achieve with Motion Energy? Yeah, so it's, it's completing that trial uh, next spring um, and, and demonstrating the su success of the technology. It's getting that substantial commercial traction from a customer, you know, really towards getting a system offshore. Um, and then it's and then we're also working on scaling up. So we're working on the larger scale technology, the Blue Horizon. So we have a project uh, to get that in the water in a couple of years. So it's progressing that as well.